uh, bop in the <laughs> next section, but I've asked for a group effort and uh, a little bit about what it's about. And, and I'll interject, I'll probably interject more than Bob wants me to in the next section, but it's okay. Uh, we'll figure it out. I do that a lot. The, this is a repeat, and it's a repeat from, four, or from two or three years ago. I don't know when we last did it. It's two or three years ago. It's lessons learned basically from installing analyzers in the system uh, and uh, I didn't ask if anybody had any questions about the PLCs and I'll take it. But when we go out and do analyzer replacements, we do a lot of those. And when we do PLC replacements, we do a lot of those. Uh, and software upgrades and, and SEMS replacements or SEMS upgrades. What are all the things that we need to consider? What are the things that we have trouble with? Uh, what happens when you replace a heated sample line? That sounds easy. Not always as easy as needs or should be. Uh, people have gone more to, we used to use only lines that had to be determined, the link could not be changed or altered more than a slight amount. And a lot of our customers want to be able to cut off 100 feet. Wasting money, by the way, I'm going to tell you, they're 50, 60, 70 dollars on foot. So you're not, you cut off 100 feet of line. And it's right one site in Texas that ordered 190 extra feet. 190 extra feet of heated sample line. Uh, don't understand that. But uh, so we, we can trim the lines to a certain extent, but we can't just. Hack them on. But what are the what are the things you have to think about? What are the things you have to talk about? Do you need an engineer to come out to the site? Do you need someone to visit before we do all the work? Uh, what's necessary? What isn't necessary? What can you do yourself? So all of those things are things that we've learned over the course of time as we become. Uh, well, we used to just do some systems, and we'd build a shelter or a cabinet, and we'd send it out, and that's all we did, and then. I found out that Len designed some systems too well, and we built them too well because they never they never got old. They just kept working, but some of the components broke, and so we'd have to go out and replace the components. Well, the old components weren't available, so we'd have to put new components. So our business model has really shifted. Probably 50% of our work today is replacing old stuff in existing shelters. And that's a whole new business model that you hadn't anticipated. 10 or 15 years ago. And so it's uh, now what we do a lot. And as we do that, we learn more and more every time we go out and be able to do that. And so this next topic is kind of an open discussion. And I have a lot of people here uh, from a lot of different areas. Wes is here as the head of the field service group, but we also have Robert back there. Robert, raise your hand. I don't think anybody met you earlier. Really. Uh, Robert's one of our field service techs. We have David, who's our operations manager, whose guys have to build all the stuff that goes out in the field. Uh, that's here. Cindy Lee is back there, who's head of our PLC group. She has a fancy title, but basically she's head of our PLC group. Uh, and they do an incredible amount of PLC replacements and software upgrades and software replacements and, uh, on other people's hardware and what that looks like. And, uh, and then Bob's going to do the talking up here in a minute uh, about. Uh, He's the head of our engineering group, uh, and then Len's here with all of his experience. Reggie's here from a regulatory standpoint. I'm here because I put my finger on everything uh, and deal with the pricing on stuff, and West does too. And so we're, we're all kind of going to share ideas as some things come up. We'll interject, ask questions, because you might have some situations where you say, Do I really want that water bath, or should I switch to a thermoelectric cooler? I really want that thermoelectric cooler, or should I get one of your really great water baths? I hope that was obvious. Like I said. Uh, so whatever whatever that happens to be, we, we look at all those different things. So uh, Bob, you can take it from here and we'll see what goes. Okay. Okay, so like Paul said, uh, we're doing a lot of these upgrades, um, especially springtime and in the fall, although this fall is not quite as busy as past fall, but um, everybody here knows that when the outages are, 
and that's when they want the work done. So you know, get, get a huge rush uh, at those times of the year. Um, we just went through a pretty busy spring. Lots of analyzers uh, being changed out, PLC being changed out, um, some sample system stuff. Um, so when it's time to upgrade any of your equipment, a couple of questions you have to ask. Uh, you know, how complicated is the project? Do you need an engineer or one of the proposal engineers to go to the site to evaluate the equipment that you have and make their recommendations? Uh, that's a good way to go. Uh, I'd say that we're only doing site visits 10% of the time. So it's not common that we be a visit site, but it's certainly uh, advisable. Especially the complicated type of um, replacement project. Um, and then every time there's a replacement, you have to consider, as Walt mentioned, that the new equipment may not be compatible with what you had before. So, um, what might seem like straightforward replacement gets more and more complicated as you start to dig deeper. Uh, and certainly, you know, Wes and the engineer, we will. Identify those things and try to get them up front during the proposal stages as best we can. Um, one of the things that we run into on these projects is, especially when it's somebody else's sense, is are the drawings accurate? How do, how do we get our information? Um, you know, a picture helps a lot. We always ask for pictures, photos of all the equipment they could have, but uh, you know, drawings are critical. And it's so often that we don't get drawings. Working blind a lot of times. So uh, keeping uh, good tabs on your drawings would be very helpful. Obviously, but, uh, it's not always the case. Um, these systems are very old and drawings have either disappeared or they're just no longer accurate because things have changed so much over the years and they weren't updated as well. We do the best that we can to keep up on the drawings. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you're totally encouraged to do is to make sure we get to those updated drawings and we're done. That's our responsibility, but it definitely helps. Um, you know, and sometimes something might change, like there's a new alarm that comes with a new piece of equipment that you have, the old piece of equipment didn't have a fault alarm, the new one does, so now you need a software upgrade where you probably weren't participating in. So, little things come up in these projects. A um, couple other things, you know, find the installation. Um, you know, we got an idea of what needs to happen before we go to a site. Uh, we have to communicate that to you guys as best we can so that we're all on the same page. Uh, sometimes we might need additional support. Um, for instance, even sample lines, we don't, we don't install those. You have to get a contractor to do that. So uh, understanding your role to get that contractor and get that uh, figured out before we get to the site. And then finally, of course, making sure they are installed before we get to the site. Um, one of the things, though, that always become an issue is downtime. Um, always, but quite frequently, downtime is a problem. Um, we get to the site and we're ready to do the work, and we we're told we can't work. Our field guy. And it's because there is a, you know, a spike in the power demand, you guys got to run the dirt. And there's not much we can do about it, um, except to give you an idea beforehand that you know, we need to know, but you, we need to uh, coordinate as best we can the downtime so that we are able to do the work when we get excited and uh, we're, we're there at the right time. Um, and build, build on you, that's another thing. Um, but I'm just curious about things like being sent on survey. Storage is supply on that these days too. Is that like everything else? Um, yeah. We've been getting mostly uh, lines and tech heaters and thermal on uh, Orion um, occasionally. 
I'd say Ted Peters is still on their standard schedule about five weeks. And Thermon slipped for a while. Um, they say they're getting back, uh, not quite seen it yet, but um, some lines put in. But I, I would give Thermon eight weeks, fortunately, right now. They, they say they're hiring more people. The thing with them is it's not a supply thing as much, although they have had some supply issues. Uh, for them, it's manpower. They just uh, have ramped up their business and uh, have been able to keep up. Keep saying they're hiring more people, it's going to turn around, so we'll see. Um, no safety requirements that's for, for any kind of work. We're going to a site, we have to make sure we understand what the requirements are so our guys are ready and get uh, easily to work, hopefully, as quickly as possible, considering what kind of requirements there are. Safety training, that sort of thing. So, all this should get worked out before we get to the site. Um, sometimes, if you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of burden for us to carry a whole bunch of extra tools when you guys have a lot of tools on the site. So sometimes we'll actually ask you, can we borrow a drill? No, before you know, if it's a problem, we'll bring a drill. It's not a big deal, but uh, it's just that's something you have to have to ship, ship back and all that stuff. So occasionally you might ask for some tools. Um, I don't want to be prepared, but it makes more sense to work out. Uh, other things that happen uh, during equipment upgrades is the environmental side of it. Uh, because you change the analyzer, there's some requirements that you have to meet uh, by EPA. It might be a new RATA certification, um, calibrations, EPAs, audits. Uh, we have a little chart again. The fridge can help confirm it's on there. Um, that's another consideration, and you know that usually additional work that uh, Cisco does most of these projects. So uh, it's going to be talked about up front with the cost associated with making sure monitoring plan with you see plan get updated. If it's somebody else's QA QC document, we like to get a copy of it and then uh, plan pay for yourselves. We get a copy so that we can understand where you're at with that and help uh, update it as well. So we can work with other people's documents. Usually, what we'll do is we'll transfer all the data to our document, and that way it's one of our statement documents, but it'll contain the data that we had previously. So the other thing about that is being prepared for those certification requirements because if you have to do a RATA, uh, you have to have RATA be prepared. Um, so that has to happen up, up front. You have to understand that that part has to be coordinated in the timeline. So as far as other documents go, a lot of times I hope this are updated. Uh, DOG specifications are updated. The DOG specification, if you're not familiar, is the DOS computer uh, specification, which says what the limits are, what parameters are in the system, what signals are being um, utilized to make calculations, what the calculations are. So it's really for our software group so that they can program the software, but it's also for you to understand what's in the software. That's an important document that should get updated uh, if it's relevant to what's being done. Uh, new drawings being applied. Uh, you know, drawings are always required. Uh, there's other emphasis. With non Cisco system, we're limited in how much drawing updates we can do. We just give you what we've done you know, as far as changes go. We'll reference your, your other drawings. So it's uh, ABB system. We'll reference the ABB drawings, but uh, we'll, we'll make new drawings for what portion of the work that we are responsible Uh, own up and manual updates, uh, those certainly go along with drawing updates and other documents. Uh, it's basically a compilation of all the documents for your system. Uh, that's not always an option that's taking on some of these updated project projects because um, they're not always so complicated that they're required. But um, we'd like to try to get those manuals updated as well. Um, 
Sometimes uh, analyzer ranges are they the same. The reason why that's up there is because sometimes uh, the customer will say, we need to change our analyzers. Okay, so here you do the CO analyzer. And um, when you're replacing the analyzer, it just seems like a good time to upgrade your ranges while you're at it. Um, a lot of times, the old ranges, range you don't capture all of your startup emissions. Um, old ranges might be 0 to 10 and 0 to 200. And you, you well know that uh, if you're a startup, you're way above 200 feet down. So uh, you want to capture all your emissions, which most agencies are requiring to do now. You want to bump up that secondary range. You may as well do it now or upgrade the analyzer. Of course, what that means, you can do cow gases. Uh, Generally, on these upgrades, we don't provide those cal gases um, because your existing site, you already have your vendors, you already buy cal gas. So, another thing that has to be coordinated is you have to have your cal gases ready or we'll get on site to install a new analyzer. You won't be able to test it. You know, then uh, some of the work that we do may uh, re result in working with equipment that might be obsolete. And no IT panel is class, for example, PLCs, um, all the things that Walt just talked about. Uh, if we can't update your OIT because it's outdated, then you're going to be limited on, on how much functionality you have at the end of the upgrade. And with those things, uh, you know, we have to find how many people we have going to the site. Um, what assistance by the plants, you know, the, we have to get on the staff, are we allowed to just climb up there? Do you have a company if that's your thing? Um, and if we send one person out for an analyzer upgrade, it's nice to have a plant uh, and you don't let's drop analyzers. Uh, just because you have to change someone on an analyzer for an installation. I might ask you some, some help on that. Uh, so, what equipment did you ship prior to installation phase? A uh, when did you uh, ship it? Um, you know, that's you try to ship things as soon as possible. So, uh, I just have to be there in time to be relevant to when we're ready to install it. And if you have to install it before we get there, and you pro, you need a couple of weeks to do that. So, find that out. Uh, Making sure equipment is essential. Okay, this is a big one. Um, sometimes when our field guy gets to the site to do a analyze upgrade, um, they find that they're spending half of their first day or two days working on problems completely unrelated to the analyst because there's a leak in the system. There's a um, water in the system. So uh, there's all kinds of other issues that will make it very difficult for us to prove that our analyzers are working correctly. Uh, new analyzer. So um, you can't, we don't want to put a new analyzer in and have water in the analyzer. So we end up spending extra time uh, doing things that were really out of, out of scope. So this is a, a you know, big one. How do we deal with it? You know, you usually just have to deal with it, you fix the system up the best you can, get the job done. It means extra hours. And you know, we're going to try to go back and charge you for those extra hours. It was uh, happening. So, this is another thing to be aware of. Make sure you sit in good shape before you have Okay, so the example lines. Uh, everyone wants to know the lifespan of the example line. And it's a really difficult one because uh, it's really all, all over the place. We know that there's plenty of lines that have been off for operating for 20 years, and it's amazing they still work. And just don't touch it, you know, don't run it into the fire, don't even turn it on and off. That might happen. But uh, they, they were. Um, others have failed fairly quickly after just a few years. Uh, it's hard to say exactly why um, there's such a big diversity. Um, I think it's just the quality of the building the same line. So, um, what we do is we kind of take the average here and say that a sample line should last about 10 years. So 
do a bell. Uh, so uh, another couple things on sample lines. Uh, we have used head technical eaters as our main supplier of sample lines for, for years and years for a long, long time. Um, we made a great line, and some of those lines are the ones that have been in service for 20 years. Uh, however, there was a period where they started to lose their quality control and there was, um, they had immediate failures. And so we started looking at other lines and we learned that uh, the other lines have their advantages and they, they work very well. We're not seeing a lot of disadvantage from them. So uh, we are now recommending um, other suppliers, Fairmont, and at that overtake. So if you call out and say you want to sample line, we're going to go with Fairmont, most likely. So, it's just a more robust line. It, is, it just looks stronger. It is stronger. The, the jacket is more robust. It's just a better quality line, um, in our opinion. Uh, and the other big advantage of it, of course, is that it's trimmable. So for you guys, that may not be such an issue. In fact, I go in the opposite direction. If you're replacing a line, you're not concerned with getting a line that's too long. You know the line. You're going to get the same line you have. Um, most of the time, that shouldn't be a problem. But uh, for new systems, when the, line, the length's not known, you know, that even becomes a better, I mean, uh, there might become a better option because you can cut the line. So if you want an extra 50 feet, pay for it, and then uh, cut it, to, cut it to, to length, so it fits really well. Customers really like that. They don't like to have excess line, you know, uh, exactly back and forth. Um, so that's the uh, big, big advantage of the thermos. The disadvantages, you know, I don't want to get too far into it, um, but disadvantages are, you know, that uh, with, with the parallel construction line, you can have parts of it that aren't working, you never know it, or it's really hard to tell, and you have cold spots, but um, we haven't seen that as being a significant problem, at least having uh, proven itself. Um, so, like I said, we'll, we'll recommend these uh, all the suppliers, Zermon, Inotech, others. Uh, basically, it's a group that we call parallel construction lines because you can come to length, you know, a 20 foot, 24 inch line instead of one big, you know, 120 foot line or 200 foot line. Um, it's series of straight up uh, parallel construction. Um, So uh, the two big things you want to consider if you're considering changing lines is if you've got tech heaters, you want to replace it, you can put a new tech heaters line in there and it's going to be a very easy job to replace it because it's going to be the right length, all the connections are going to be the same, power requirements are the same, the diameter is the same, it's just going to fit in, it's going to be connected to a couple of tubes, get your power connection, you're done. But if you want to switch from a tech heaters line to a thermal line, you got to work a little hard. Okay, because the thermal line has a much bigger diameter. It's actually a less efficient line, so they need more insulation to almost get the heat. Um, but by doing that now, you've got to deal with the fact that it doesn't fit in the hole that you have in your bulkhead, you know, it doesn't fit in the hole of the probe. If you have to drill bigger holes, you have to change up to a larger uh, speed train booth, that sort of thing. The other thing with these lines is they don't come pre-terminated, so you have to terminate them. So you have to have someone qualified, you know, medium qualified electrician to make those electrical connections and seal the line to make sure the water gets in, that kind of thing. So it's more installation work. Usually we do the work. So if we're going to install at least a portion of it. We won't install the line of staff, but you know, almost all of these projects we're going out to actually open the line uh, termination. But we can do that work. Uh, our guys do it all the time. Uh, we do still recommend the sample line control. If you're going to do a sample line upgrade, um, 
controlling that line to a no temperature is highly recommended. You're just going to save it here, uh, and you're going to have peace of mind knowing you know what the temperature is. Because uh, with lines that aren't temperature controlled, they, they operate on a principle of minimum temperature. So if your minimum temperature is, say, 350 degrees for a pneumonia style, you know, with a line that uh, has ammonia presence, you know, I keep the temperature up to 350, but I need ammonia salt to perform it. So at 350, that's the minimum temperature. So that means it's always harder than 350. So it could be 400, it could be 420. Oh, it's not 450 because I think they're going to see some damage at that point, but they, they, they tend to run hot. So controlling the line to your known temperature is just a better way to go. Um, we have in the past uh, recommended using an alternate um, uh, online offline set point on, on, on the temperature of the sampling so that when the turbine's online, you want it to be full temperature, like 350 degrees Fahrenheit. But when it's offline, you recommend to bring that temperature down to say 150 to save the heater. And the reason behind that is that the um, that, that heater, if, it's, if the process is off, that heater has to work very hard because it's pulling in air in the wintertime. It could be zero degree, 20 degree air. It's trying to heat up 350 degrees. So you're, you're basically maxing out, maxing out that, uh, that heater. Um, however, we found that there's been a lot of times that we've had problems with this method of, of going offline and turning down that temperature. Um, the time it takes for the, for the sample line to change temperatures uh, has resulted in some moisture contaminating the sample line, contaminating the sample, uh, causing delays in the response to the analyzers. So uh, there's also been issues where um, the signals are telling us that the turbine's offline, but it's not. You know, there's still moisture in the process that's getting into the sample line. So um, after all, much ado, we, we decided that we're, we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to keep the temperature state. So that's sample line. We got a lot of topics here. Um, and I don't want people to forget about them, you know, at the end. So anybody have questions on sample lines? So you mentioned uh, zigzag. Now, ours are all zigzag now from day one. Yes. Is there a reason for that, or can I run it straight down? Run straight up. <laughs> the reason why, the reason why is because uh, the engineer gas bed is going to be 150 foot line. When uh, it, so if someone someone had a model, they said it's going to be 120 feet. And the engineer said, okay, well, I don't want to order it too short, so I'm going to make it 140 feet. He felt the first conversion 140 feet, and they said, well, I don't want to make it too short, so they have. Next thing you know, we got the hundred foot line, and they get it to the, to the, to the site, and they can't, they, they can't cut that line because they can't use it. So they, instead of cutting it, they have to take that back and forth. So I didn't know if it was to support the weight or no. I mean, I, I have to see your installation to say for sure. I just, from my understanding, any time you stick that is because the line is too long. The line only needs to be supported every 25 feet on a vertical support. Um, so, and it's almost always installed the cable tray. But you don't put the termination between the block down cut it down. Yeah, you can't fix that one. No, no, but, but I'm intending my exact line probably is 17 years old. I was planning on doing a analyzer and the sample line change. If I'm going to change it to the sample line, I go back to the 140 foot line when I can. Yeah, you're going to save a lot of money. I mean, uh, that, you know, if it's an extra 40 feet that you're saving, it'll be times 60. Awesome. Uh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. already terminated yet? Yeah, that's yeah. sealed off. I'm sorry, say it Isn't the one end already terminated and done? Just have to yeah, terminate. that's how we work. The, the top end is just is back re terminated. We just have to terminate the bottom. Now, 
if it gets installed correctly, then that's great. But a lot of times, someone did the installer of the line, the contractor, like, oh, you zip line, puts it up, and it's three feet above the pro. So it makes it great to have extra. So now you can either can move that line and zigzag it, or you can unless you want to do the whole line over again. Or you just cut that three feet off, so you might be turning it. Oh, yeah, I was saying you still do have to be careful at the bottom end because the thermocouple only goes a certain distance. Uh, that's true. Yeah. But that's only if you really overestimate the length of the. We have had trouble where we can totally cut the thermocouple out of the sample line. That's never good. Yeah. That's happening. You know, and if you cover that, you know, we, we put the thermocouple 50% up the line, and like, okay, now it's. <laughs> should be impossible, <laughs> and they still cut it off. <laughs> it's happened. When y'all replaced our heated sample lines, one of the points y'all made a, a big deal about was not using zip ties attaching them. Zip ties are okay. Uh, that was they get used quite a bit. It, it, what we don't like is the little zip, zip ties that you typically see that are just quarter of an inch. That really get a lot more like, power to it. Yeah, yeah. Quarter of a square inch. So if you get the half inch ones, it works pretty well. Okay. Um, you know, the other option is to use power uh, grips for vertical support. That they're high level. And the other thing is, uh, I see a lot of metal clamps. Metal clamps tend to be special. You know, I, I think they work, but I'd say that I like the plastic better because it doesn't like you have to tighten it down as much. You see any problem with tie wraps? Plastic tie wraps? No, I think the plastic is okay. You'll probably break the tie wrap before you cinch it down too tight. But if you use metal, you can potentially damage the internal stem. Yeah, I, was I just remember it being a point issue I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Yeah, so if your difficulty though is to find out what length line you need, you know, you've got to cut out all that zigzag and you need an accurate line because you can't go off of the original line. Any other simple line questions? You'll see here on the updated line control that we have. Yeah, we use a lot of other controllers typically. Um, we do some control with the uh, power PLC as well. We like, we like the walk load because it's, we think it's more, I think it's more robust in my personal opinion. It's uh, a contacts on PLC is definitely fail after some time. And you can have some problems with the rigid solid state on PLCs. Also, on our real heat, when we have the temperatures that are on my offline, it's a bit that we just spent that for a while. Uh, you, you can do that. The other thing you can do is just to lower it so it's still up the, the, the offline temperature, so it's still above the acid three point. So if you've got 350 for your, for your stack uh, for your online, you can make it 250 or 220 for your online. It'd be safe. Now, I mean, and then again, if you're not having any problems, your signals are working, and uh, it, what we think is it has a lot to do with response time of the sample line. So if you've got a tech heaters line, I don't know if that's what you have, but uh, you know, I don't know. Okay. The tech, okay, the way tech heaters works is they have a heater wire that is actually uh, wrapped around the tube that is the sample. So the heat transfers the meat, whereas with these other lines, it's a separate cable. And, uh, Cable is good because it provides much more protection rather than that exposed wire. But it takes a lot longer for your heat to, to, to you know, the sample temperature to get up to the set point because of that separation. PLC OIT replacement. Um, Okay, we talked about how uh, GE doesn't do that anymore. Alex uh, Alan Emerson, uh, the RX3I, um, Alan Bradley's clicks, it's time to repeat stuff. 
it's actually not, uh, it's not components really are obsolete already in the slits. So it's not just a matter of high cost. Some from some parts and modules. Um, you know, uh, we recommend uh, for PLC replacement, compact and control logics, go out to very expensive version. Um, don't really see the need for it. We don't see failure to the compact logics. Really, the only need is to recover the kind of required. As I mentioned. Um, and automation direct is, is the most, most often, uh, the panel we use most often. Uh, Alan Bradley is still fairly popular. Get away from Maples, you know that. Uh, so this is all kind of repeated from, from that. Yes, Cindy. Can you explain the same thing that I've run separately? I've, I've uh, something about the projects that were being used for coffee, um, you know, Okay. Yeah. Yeah, class one div two. We 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 do class one div two um projects. Um, I don't know, ten percent of the time, fifty percent of the time. So it's not always the top of my mind, but that's that's a good point. Class one div two is bringing a whole other aspects of equipment and whatnot. So uh, we haven't addressed that at all here. Most of you talking about the general purpose stuff. So again, this is uh, covered by the wall. Uh, data loggers. We do replace data loggers uh, on occasion. Uh, there's a time when we didn't quite frequently. Now it's kind of calmed calm down a little bit, but the VAC data logger uses corporate policy that motivates that change and it over Cisco. Uh, so we'll go out, we've got a good method of changing out uh, the data logger. You don't have to quite clean their wiring, use their connectors, you connect it up to a set of connectors that we make and we're pre-wired PLC, so it's really good to turn it. Okay, serial communication with DCS. This is always a problem when it arises. A lot of DCSs are old and uh, they don't necessarily talk Ethernet. And if they do, it's a very costly upgrade. So most customer and if they, even if they do talk Ethernet, if you can get it, you want to pay for it, you still have to program it into the DCS. So that becomes a big expense. So a lot of these sites where once upon a time everything was serial, they might keep it serial. Um, the problem with that is it's outdated technology to some degree. And uh, the DCS now they use now Bradley. Alan Bradley is very finicky about talking serial to the server. Protocol. We try to mesh protocols with a DCS. You might say that oh, it will talk to each plus it really doesn't want to do it. Um, we've got plenty of sites. Where we struggle with uh, serial communications. And usually the result, and soon you help me out, is that the DCS has to be upgraded. A new card has to be put into the DCS. We've been able to fix it a couple of times with changing our equipment now. And we think we've got a good serial card now, right? Yeah, that's a great idea. So we get the equipment together, we go out there before the installation and before the downtime issue comes up. There's a downtime that we have to work on it to try to test it to make it work. So come to keep in mind. So We'll try to come up with our solutions. Uh, you know, we've gone through this several times, so maybe it's not a big issue, but it has been an issue in the past. So it's something to consider here that DCS communications can be a stumbling block. Well, yeah. sometimes aren't the communications between the 
existing PLC and our DAS material as well. We have to have them lay fiber or something of that sort. Um, Plant network is not up to date. Basically. I don't know if we've got serial communications. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we have the PA. Yeah, the older age. 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 Yeah. And, uh, but that's easy, but that's easy to change over the internet. I don't know if we've ever been playing hot dogs. Yeah, but if they don't have the infrastructure already in place. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Okay. Gotcha. I suppose you can put in a first office or a computer. Yeah. A lot of people have been changing uh, over to fiber anyway because if you had a KF3 module and the other module that was on the slick, but every time it's a lightning strike, you would get <laughs> that module to fail and make that module to happen it's on the slick all the time. Um, so it's a good idea to get that fire. Protocol for every different launch. Okay, so, so testing the system, um, you know, we've really improved our in house testing over the last several years. And it's all going, but we've, we've gotten better and better. Um, we've got just a more regimented uh, procedure for our testing. So this probably is not as big a deal as it may have been. Um, but when we do our testing, you know, we test all the IO, look at the software, make sure everything's ready. We get to the site, and we find out that something not, the customer's not happy with something on the software. So the report doesn't look right, it doesn't have the right data. Um, something might be wrong. So basically all we want to do is to, to let you know that uh, we're going to make sure the system is working, but there's going to be a time period where we rely on the customers to review the software and make sure it's working the way they want it to. And um, you know, if there's any problems, we're going to fix those problems before the project. So that's that. Uh, another thing that happened, um, you know, that we, we found were problems. Um, past experiences is uh, our techs are taking longer to get the job done than we anticipated because downtime issues, service coming on, so we have to stop work and stuff like that. Um, there was something happened at the site recently, a chemical spill, like been working a day and a half, and we don't know that, right? Yeah. Good work for two days, but it was chemicals. So, um, Things happen, uh, you know, our procedure to just document what happened. You look at later, but it's financial bank or time. Okay, so uh, with regards to the PLCs, sample lines, and analyzed replacements, this is, I think, a little down your environmental requirements. So, uh, so you got part 60, you got part 75. Um, basically, part 60 kind of quiet on this kind of thing because they never really got into it. Uh, you know, what, what happens when there's a problem or breakdown or a replacement part? Part 75 does. So, this is really part 75 rules. And, uh, Rick, did you mention that you're? They were contacting all the states about this uh, part 75. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, for new analyzer, um, you have to do a data cal check. Oh, yeah, let me do this. Uh, new analyzers must pass the data cal check, so you have to do that immediately. That starts the clock for your, uh, for all the other requirements. Which is 21 days for a 70 drip test, 116 hours for the VRE checks, 720 hours operating hours for the rapture. There's uh, 21 days, 21 unit operating, operating days as well. Okay, so um, 
So be prepared for all of that and uh, understand the timeline there. Um, to be most of the time, that is out of our scope on these upgrade projects. We usually do the data and certification on new projects, but um, because you guys are already the group of this kind of thing, handle it yourselves, and you know, that's fine. Uh, so we just try to communicate this up front. Um, form data for schedule line, that's the data the cow check, and uh, we paid response time check. And if you don't know what those are, um, they're easy to look up, or you can just give us a call and talk to you about it. Response time to test is a little finicky, if there's a couple of different variations of it, but not so easy to do it And the rabbit, seven and 20 operating hours. For PLC, there's no testing required. You just have to update PC and test. Uh, so the, the one item on there that had uh, come up to be a little bit uh, controversial is an old analyzer required to run linear if operating more than 68 hours in operating unit four for the price of time. So what that means is, let's say you're going to do upgrading models. Okay, so you're what your second, your third quarter is <laughs> July to September. Um, so you're right in the middle of it, August. So you run your old analyzer for a month. Did you do a QA on those? Did you do your quarterly linear? Because you're going to put a new analyzer in August. That new analyzer is going to get you test, so it's all set. But what about all the data from the time that third quarter started up to the point you changed the analyzer? That data QA. We think it's not. That's our interpretation. Does the grace period not come into effect then? If you don't. Yeah, so, well, basically, it could come into account for that when it gets under that still grace period from the other The issue that came up with if I uh, if in if a, a linearity was done on the old analyzer in the Q2 quarter, uh, or was done on the Q2, did you need to do a linearity on that new analyzer? That's what it made to me. And it's our stand that that new analyzer is an instance to itself and you need to put a linearity on that. There is some equivocation on the fact that how the EPA responded. Uh, and it does appear in the response from Charles Prescott, it seems like you wouldn't have to do that second one here, but ECMPS would all say the opposite. On our test, we um, have the safe side to it, but not always. If it turns out that you replace the analyzer and you didn't do it, QA um, on your old analyzer before you replaced it, they might get changed by EMPS or they do not. Sounds funny, but uh, just before you replace that old analyzer, it's a good idea to run a daily count. Yeah. Uh, because you, you want to make sure that that data is QA up to the point you replace it. Otherwise, you, it may only be. Eight to 24 hours, but you may lose data based on the QA requirements of that too. So we learn the, the little nuances that don't seem like much add up after a while. And so, oh, let's run a cow on the system before we tear it apart. That sounds funny, but that's exactly what we're going to do. That's it. 